Uh, today we're going to cover what I consider to be the primitive type fields. Integers, floating point numbers, OIDs, and what was the other one? Booleans. More than just in introducing them, but also showing some of the gotchas of them where I can find them. Okay, let's start with the document that we ended with in the last episode. Uh, actually, I changed the quote and a few things, but it's largely the same document. Uh, we've got a class showing a famous quote uh, with the text and the author name, and let's go ahead and get started with uh, number fields, uh, specifically integer fields. So we've got two types in Mongo Engine. We've got uh, int fields. Let's see here. Equals int field. And let's make one that's, oh uh, yeah, the Earth's population at the time the quote was made. I just needed a large number of some kind. And uh, we'll make that one a long field. And uh, these two we can go through pretty quickly because they are exactly what they look like. Once this one's in field stores a 32 bit signed integer in the BSON document uh, in MongoDB. And the Earth population stores a 64-bit uh, signed integer. So if you need a number larger than 2 billion or less than negative 2 billion, you use a long, otherwise you'll stick with an int. Um, and if you're not sure, go with the long. Why not? That's my opinion. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and use it and so we can see what it looks like. Type fast here. My And field not defined. Oh, grief. Yeah, it's still part of a module. <laughs> and there it is. Year 1931, Earth population 2.1 billion. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at this in, uh, I use a utility called uh, Ro RoboMongo. It's a freeware program that lets you look at the uh, Mongo Engine database. Let's go ahead and already have it queued up on famous quote. So let's take a look at it. And here we are, year 1931. And it's kind of hard to see. I wish there was a way to increase the font size on this thing. At any rate, uh, it's an int 32, and then this is an int 64. So pretty straightforward. No extra options on those fields. So let's go ahead and jump right into real numbers where we've got some interesting things to talk about. <laughs> let's. Uh, add to our database here let's get our floating point numbers in so we got float field so let's do a uh, rating Me dot float. and price perhaps the price of the i don't know what that price represents the price of the document <laughs> If we used to purchase a paper copy or something? I don't know. All right, so my quote rating equals 4.3 stars. My quote dot price equals. Now, decimal field, float field is exactly what it sounds like. It's for a floating point number in Python. Decimal field is for use of the decimal uh, module that comes as a standard library in Python 2.7 as well as uh, 3. Uh, so let's make reference to that decimal and we'll make this 10 cents or in American that's one tenth of a dollar. Uh, we'll need a new course to import. Yeah, from. All right, that should run. We we'll, should see it work, and then I'll also show you the problem. That's odd, it's not jumping back to over here automatically. But anyway, uh, okay, there we go, down here. Rating 4.3, price 0 0.1. And let me show you this in RoboMongo and also show you the problem we actually have right here. Um, actually delete this document refresh and 
Here it is, 4.3, 0 0.1, and both of these are doubles. Uh, specifically, these are uh, IEEE 7... F Actually, I'll put a reference down below to where you can find this information out of it. It's a IEEE 64-bit floating point number. Um, I think in C, you would call it a double, a double float. Um, it's a good high precision number. It works for a lot of purposes. The problem with it though is that it is in binary. Um, and that sounds like a good thing. And for things like searches and sorting and a lot of other things, binary is great. But there are times when binary numbers can't represent the numbers you need. For example, the thing I just chose, 0.1, you can't represent 0.1 in a floating point number in binary. Depends on what you're doing with it, whether that's important or not, because it's close enough. <laughs> Sometimes close enough, though, isn't the correct answer. I'll give you a quick old example of that. Um, if we do um, 0 0.1 times 3 equal to 0 0.3, you would expect that will come back as a true statement. Those are equal numbers, but they're not. Uh, that's why you use the decimal library. Because what it does is internally it stores it in a decimal format rather than a binary one. Now, like I said, you can have problems in decimal as well, but they're the, they're the ones you would expect in certain contexts. For example, if you're doing this case, I'm using a price, which is used to represent money. Well, if I am doing something with money, which is represented in decimal, and then the result I want at the end is something in money represented in decimal, then my ideal thing to do is to keep it in decimal format the entire time I'm doing the math, which is one of the whole points of the decimal library. That of course comes back as true. Uh, but if I were to do something like this, uh, my quote dot uh, price times three equals Actually, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Uh, there are times when this won't. Let, let's put it that way. In this case, it did work. Um, Bongo Engine does its best to turn it back into a legitimate decimal, but it will fail under certain circumstances. Um, because of that, I personally always store decimal numbers as strings. And fortunately, Mongo Engine has a function for that. And for string equals true. Now let's run this. All right, comes back with uh, rating and price once again, but now price is shown in quotes because it in fact is a string, which means I can rest assured that it will treat 0 0.10 in decimal as 0 0.10 in decimal, both in and out. So even though it shows it as a string up on the screen, in fact, if I go to Rob Obamongo, String is in fact uh, 0 0.1 is now a string. It shows it there. I don't know if you can see it very easily, but pops up and says string. Currently, it's a string. All right. Paste. That will work as well. So uh, that's a good way to store money and other things that you want to keep in the decimal domain and not move it in the binary. Uh, there's a downside to that though, and that is if you want to search on it or you want to sort on the say the price well it being a string is actually a problem because you don't want to do a text sort when you want to do a numeric sort they, they there's all kinds of gotchas there and so what do you do well there's a few things you can do uh, personally more often than not i store both versions i'll store it a floating point price and a string price and i'll use the string price as the source of authority when i'm doing math because people don't want rounding errors on their their uh, accounting. <laughs> you know, close enough is not good enough for accounting systems. Uh, but for searching and sorting functions, I'll use the floating point version. Or what I did in one project is I actually created what we're going to be going over uh, in the next episode, which is using an embedded document. And I created my own class called Price, where it stored both versions, but you only had to set it once and it would automatically propagate the changes, save it, keep it all consistent on the inside. Um, perhaps I'll show that, maybe I'll show that in the next episode.
I don't think about that. Uh, decimal also has a bunch of other parameters you can put into it. You have a uh, min value, max value, enforcing a minimum and maximum value. Um, you can also set a level of precision, how many decimal points of precision you want stored in the database. Um, and then you can also determine how you want to do rounding. And uh, I think I have the web browser up here. I'll put a link into the uh, description of this video. You have rounding options. So you import it from decimal and you can you set the rounding for uh, how you want to round numbers. Uh, the default, I believe, is uh, half down, round half up, actually. Round half up, this one right here. So that's the decimal field. Let's jump on to uh, the next one, Boolean field. It is as exactly as it sounds. I'll be fast here. But instead of using lowercase true and false like you would in JSON, you use the Python true and false values. There we go. Confirmed real equals true. So you would use true, false, and or none. You can, in fact, send assign any of these fields to none, as long as you don't have required equals true set in your parameters. The last of them, which is object IDs. Uh, object IDs are a very important field in uh, MongoDB. They're used all over the place. Uh, a common use form is with references. Um, in fact, later episode, we'll actually look at reference fields and some called a generic reference field. We can reference other documents in the database from a document. Uh, think of them as like links from one document to the next. Uh, but uh, you can actually do that yourself with an object ID field. Of course, there's already an object ID field assigned right here, ID, OID. So if I create another object ID, it'll look just like that. Bison that object ID. If I just do an empty, oh, actually, <laughs> good point here. I do need to import Bison, which is one of the standard libraries that come with Python. Uh, Bison dot object ID creates an object ID, and uh, it will create a random one. Um, and it attempts to be as universal as possible. Now, you're not guaranteed that every time you create a random object ID that it is unique. Um, clearly, it is possible for it not to be. Um, in the context of a Mongo database, generally speaking, they are. I mean, the odds of it being not unique are really low. It's not just a random number. I believe, uh, let's see, it also represents, there's a four byte value in there that represents how many seconds have occurred uh, since January 1, 1970. So in order to get two of the same OIDs, they would have to be generated in the exact same second. There is a three byte machine identifier and there is, I'm looking up the specs here, a two byte process ID. So it'd have to be the same process on the same machine and within the same second getting the exact same random number twice in a row. Um, and it's not true random because if it's running within the same process, it starts off at a random value and then it increments with each use. So if it's the same process, almost by definition, it's it, it's keeping track. It's a unique number because <laughs> it's always going to be incrementing. Unless, of course, you create more than, was it, four byte value? Unless you make four billion o OIDs within one second, then you've got a problem. It's not likely you're going to encounter a duplicate OID in any universal format. Not impossible. But not likely. Let's run this just to see. See what it looks like. There's ref and there's our IOID. Um, of course, you can also put a direct value in there if you happen to know a value. These are long things. They're 24 character strings representing 12 bytes. Uh, it's, it's in hexadecimal. So I could do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Six, seven, seven, eight, nine, A, B. There. Oh, and there it is. So uh, that's the what I consider to be the primitive fields. Um, actually, I guess technically from a BSON document point of view, there's a few more like date time, but we'll do that in the last episode. Um, there's a lot of lot of fields that basically we just need to cover. We don't need to demonstrate. 
but we'll take a look at them as the time comes. Um, I will see you in the next episode where we cover structured fields, which are list fields and essentially dictionary fields and their variations like map fields and that type of thing. I will see you next time. Please consider subscribing. Thanks.